So there are many verses about the second coming of Jesus in the Bible, yep. particularly Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13 and Luke 21. Yes. Do you have any general comments about these verses? Certainly, um, there's a lot of things I could say about these particular verses. Firstly, any of the comments that I made that were later recorded in these verses were referring to the Jewish system of things uh, that I saw and what I saw occurring in the Jewish system of things. One of the primary things I saw in the Jewish system of things was that in the future, because of the Jewish opposition to Roman oppression, that eventually the Romans would come and destroy the seat of the Jewish power, which was Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And they would completely annex that power at some point in the future. This is something that I felt very strongly. And many of the spirits who were with me, um, who I often spoke with, felt also very strongly about. And so, you know, of course, in almost any day, any time a person lives, you get this uh, feeling that you would like to know a bit about the future. You know, what, what's going to happen in the future? And, and one of the questions that I was frequently asked is what's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen with the Roman world power and, and what effect it has on us here in Jerusalem, for example? And the main reason why most people asked that question was they expected the Messiah to be a person who would come and conquer the Roman oppression and set up kingship on the earth in Jerusalem and eventually be the king of the entire earth. That's what they expected from the Messiah. And so it was a frequently asked question. Sometimes it was asked by people in power, you know, who were concerned for their power. And other times it was asked as a sincere question by disciples who knew the prophetic references to the Messiah and who misinterpreted those particular references. And so they'd often come up to me and ask me questions about, you know, what's going to happen in our future? When are you going to put in the, you know, the power, you know, when are you going to become king and all those kind of things. Now, of course, I never was going to become king and never will become king, in my opinion. I, I don't know what God's got planned for me, but that's how I feel. And the reality is that many of them wanted me to become a king of sorts so that they could feel like they've been freed from Roman oppression. But there were also sincere people wanting to know about the future mm -hmm. and what would happen in the future. And one of the things that I taught very frequently was that if you opposed something, if you spent a lot of your energy and effort into violent, in violent opposition, eventually opposition would come back to mm -hmm. you and there would be violent opposition in return. And this is something that, uh, a principle that I was constantly trying to help people understand, a principle that if you love people, eventually love would return. If you hate people or treat people violently, eventually violence would return. Mm -hmm. And these were basic principles about how God has created the universe. And so when they asked me questions about what is the future of the Jewish system of things, I could give them quite direct answers about what I believed the current future of the Jewish system of things would be based on what I perceived was the general attitude of the Jewish people towards Roman oppression. And so I foretold the many things uh, about Roman oppression and the Jewish system of things and what would happen. So uh, could you put that in context of the, the verses then that we're referring to? Sure. You're actually saying that those verses weren't referring to your return to earth. They were just speaking about the fall of a Jewish system? Well, one thing you must understand that I had by this stage talked about my potential death with my disciples and my wife, yourself, and my disciples all knew that I would potentially die at some time in the short term future. Now, many of them also felt that I, that I would be able to come back because they, they could see that I wasn't a king yet. And many of the things they believed the Messiah, what would happen to the Messiah hadn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And so what they believed was very different to what I believed. What I believed was that I probably wouldn't come back onto the planet in a very short period of time, if at all. And what I believed was that uh, um, there was no need to come back onto the planet because I had a good understanding in the spirit world and a good understanding of what I needed to do in the spirit world to establish God's kingdom, if you like, in the celestial, kingdom, in the celestial realms. And so um, I knew there was a lot of work to be done in the spirit world. 
So I, I didn't have a, a strong feeling about coming back to Earth straight away or anything like that. So could I just clarify, because I know you're going to go on, but yep. what about the resurrection? I mean, are you speaking about coming back to Earth permanently? Yes, yeah, or... so I knew that I would come back to Earth temporarily right. after my death yep. to prove to people that there was no such thing as death. Mm -hmm. I, I already knew that that would occur. Um, because it was my strong desire and I also knew from the feelings I had between myself and God that that was a high likelihood of being able to be done. So, And I understood the laws of physics and the laws of nature that were involved in my, my doing such a thing. Sure. And so I knew that I'd be able to do that at some point uh, after my death. So I knew that instantly after my death I'd be able to prove to people that I'm still alive. Mm -hmm. I'm not referring to that here. Okay. Um, I'm referring to my return at some future time. And at that point, I didn't have any strong feeling about returning to the earth at some future time. I believed there was a lot of work to be performed in the spirit world. I believed there was a lot of things that needed to be occur in the spirit world in terms of things that I needed to learn myself, but also things that I needed to share with others in order for life in the spirit world to improve. Because I realized that life in the spirit world was in, in many cases even worse than life on earth for many yeah. people. So, you know, I knew that I would be spending a lot of my time talking to people in the spirit world after my death. For that reason, um, I didn't have a very strong feeling about uh, returning to the earth. I felt that at one point in the future, perhaps there might be the potential potentiality of me doing such a thing. But I didn't predict such a thing. In fact, uh, uh, at all, ever. I never predicted any of those events. Well, that's a big thing to say, because mm. there's a lot of Bible um, Versus that say I did. Yes. Yes. And uh, but I did predict predict the fall of the Roman world power. Uh, I did predict the fall of you know the fall of Jerusalem before the fall of the Roman world power. I did predict predict the the distortion of truth that would occur over time. The distortion of my true teachings over time. The I predicted the establishment of organisations which would. Uh, which would eventually suppress true Christianity. Mm -hmm. I predicted the suppression of Christianity and persecution of Christians shortly after my time. I predicted all those events mm -hmm. and told my disciples that all of these events would, would definitely occur. So there were many things I did predict and, um, and there were some things that I did not. Now, a person who's at one with God can predict many things mm -hmm. and, uh, and also does not feel very much concern about death and so does not feel a huge amount of concern about the predictions they're making either. Yeah. Now, Matthew 24, Mark uh, 13, Luke 21 are all uh, verses that are contained in the Bible that are about what's meant to be the coming or my second coming. The mm -hmm. assumption is that it's about my second coming. Most Christian religions believe that it talks about, you know, the, 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 pred the prediction of events after my death, but they feel that it has a greater fulfillment in the prediction of the second coming. These kind of things arose because many of the disciples that I had at the time believed that I would come again and desperately wanted me to. This is, this is very plain to see in the writings of Paul, for example, where he expected me to come during his own lifetime. And many of the disciples who, uh, who after I died, uh, felt that they expected me to return to them during my lifetime, during their lifetime, because they knew I was still alive. Yeah. Because I had appeared to them, they knew I was still alive. And many of them became very confused about why I did not reappear to them during their lifetime. Not understanding that there were a whole large amount of jobs occurring in the spirit world that I now wanted to engage, which were very important, and many of them were more important, in fact, than what could occur on Earth. And the reason why was because many of the people in the spirit world were influencing the events on Earth, and therefore the people in the spirit world needed to change. Mm -hmm. And we needed to have, like, what I would classify as an army, you could call it. It's not an army about violence, but it's an army of people who all understand the truth mm -hmm. in the spirit world at the time of my death, there were very few people in the spirit world who understood the truth. And as a result, very, very few people that won with God by the time of my death. And I knew that this needed to change in order for everything else to change. Mm. And so that became my primary focus. My primary focus was improving the spirit world conditions so that more people can become at one with God. And once more people became at one with God, eventually they'll get to a point where there'll be masses of people at one with God in the spirit world. 
and I knew that they would have a, a beautiful positive effect on events that could occur in the earth on the earth and in the spirit world, in the darker realms of the spirit world. So you're really saying your focus was actually on the spirit world after you passed and you had no intention at that time of returning? No. The only time that I spent on earth after my passing was time that I spent with you and my family yep. and with different people of, you know, who were people that I loved, who I wanted to guide uh, and assist into having the proper viewpoint of relationship with God, relationship with themselves and their own happiness. And I did guide to a large degree the different things that happen with the Christian faith. So whenever I noticed people attacking the Christian faith, I spent time trying to reverse those particular events. And this is one of the reasons why I tried to influence Paul when he was Saul. Mm -hmm. So Paul was not named Paul initially, he was named Saul. He was a Pharisee who spent a lot of time attacking Christians. Uh, around Jerusalem in particular and and I realized that if he used his zeal in a different direction then that would be wonderful yeah. and if he used his continued to use his zeal attacking Christians there wasn't going to be much left of Christians at the end of his zeal and so you know this is why I appeared to him in a vision like state and educated him about the divine truth and got him to change so there are many things like that that I did after my death but if we get back to the actual question, which is about the, the, uh, for those three primary chapters talking about future events, I did not predict any future events based on my return. Um, and it was only after my death that disciples, pe people who wanted me to return, came up with what they believed were indications that I would return. And ironically, some of them are correct now. You know, so some of them are prophetic in nature and some of them are correct. And many of the, some of the things that they've said about my second coming are going to be true. <laughs> but, but they uh, had received that direction from spirits and through their own inclination to believe such a thing. Right, because there is a lot of irony in what you're saying. Yes. That you, ironically, you are saying you didn't, you, you thought it might be possible that you could return, but yep. it was not, you were not trying to prophesy your own return no. in the statements that are recorded in the Bible. Exactly. Uh, so there was no intention, um, at, but yet a whole group of people, a very massive group of people have been awaiting your return based on writings that were recorded after your death. And my, almost all of the disciples after my death were awaiting my immediate return. So, they've, so and people so, are still waiting today. And people are still waiting. Yeah. Uh, so that's ironic. Yes, it is ironic. <laughs> then we add to the, the fact that you did discover, well, we did discover that we could return and have returned and now all those people waiting do not see you. Exactly, that's ironic too, isn't that's it? That's all ironic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And because it's not, uh, my return isn't uh, in the manner in which the first century disciples conceived it to be. Yeah. Um, people then don't believe that I've returned. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> very. And it's very, um, you know, it would be a lot simpler if you just said... <laughs> So what? <laughs> <laughs> that you that you uh, thought you were going to return. I know you can't say it because it's not true. No, it's not true. But it, mm. it is. Um, it's highly. It feels highly. I imagined that it was possible. Yeah. But I, but I didn't uh, see it as a likelihood in my near future. And I know that the disciples, when I passed, had a desire for it to occur in their time. Because they, many of them were unwilling to live without me in yeah. a lot of ways, which was one of the problems. I know that, yes. Uh, one of the problems, yeah. as you know, was that many of the disciples were unwilling to engage the divine truth without me doing it with them. Yeah. And, and this is one thing they had to learn. They, they finished up learning that quite rapidly after yeah. my death. Yeah. Once they worked through a lot of their grief and I returned to them and they had the proof and evidence that what I was saying to them was true, then of course they had a lot of deep motivation to, to present truth to people in the world. They started to personally live it a lot more than they were before then. You know, before then they were often just talking about it and not living it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and many of the people as a result grew hugely and towards their relationship with God and their relationship with truth during that time period. And of course, um, you know, God's spirit through this love 
flowed through them, helping them to come to, con to terms with the conceptions of truth that I taught them while I was alive that they didn't really understand at the time. At the time. Mm. So if we can be really clear then what Matthew Mark and Luke wrote mm -hmm. did you make those statements because well some... I made some of them <laughs> again and other parts have been embellished by my own disciples yes. and by others since into something that is definitely not true but you are saying that some of those embellishments were inspired and some. so are accurate and some. some are not exactly so again we're in this hodgepodge a little bit of um some things you said, some things you didn't, some things were inspired correctly and some things were just... Uh, yes, and once you understand on. human nature and you understand how the spirit world works with the material world and so forth, you can understand how all of those things can occur. Certainly. So to me it was not surprising that yeah. such a thing would occur. But I understand that to a lot of Christians it might be surprising to hear what I'm saying. Perhaps a little stressful. Well, a little stressful only because they believe the Bible to be holy God's word yeah. and therefore, you know, they are unwilling to have critical analysis based on love and truth and consistency. If I, if I maybe give some illustrations about the consistency, for example, like in the, in the Bible it states uh, and it portrays me as in my second coming, as coming as a ruler, coming as a world domineering ruler who subjugates the nation's and uh, places them as a stool for my feet. In other words, that all of the nations um, are going to be ruled by myself. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. It's completely inaccurate, of course, and, and, and false, but that's what it says. But in other areas, it says almost completely the opposite. And if I can illustrate these particular yeah. things. So, so if you read Matthew 24, for example, mm -hmm. um, in 29 verse, through to 31, it says, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and all the heavenly bodies will all be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. Then it says, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Right, that's what it says. Yeah. Now, um, anybody who knows me would never believe that. Anybody who knew me in the first century would never believe that. This is a verse added after the fir my first century life. And, and it's a, a verse um, added to, for, for a lot of different reasons. Some to control people, some to inspire people, some to to make people feel that they were just waiting for the second coming, constantly waiting. Or well, similar to how the Jews were constantly waiting for the Messiah mm -hmm. and still are waiting, yes. even though the Messiah came 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Um, and it's very similar in nature to that. But also I say that it's not my nature to do such a thing. Mm -hmm. Because what this verse portrays, and many other verses also portray, is that I would come, I would come in this demonstration of great power and glory and I would, I would take from the earth the elect, in other words, the people who supposedly know the truth and, and, and believe in me, and then all the others I would destroy. Mm -hmm. That's what it's basically stating. And the book of Revelation states quite clearly. Now, if you look at other verses, so for example, if we go back to Matthew 4 and we go to verse 8, it says, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. And he says, all of this I will give you if you bow down and worship me. Well, if a person really thought about that verse, and, and then I, apparently the verse says, I said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In other words, I rejected the offer of world rulership. Mm. And in a way, Satan is, in this verse was just offering me the same thing God was. So why would I reject it? Like, it makes no sense. Um, if Satan is offering me, bow down to me and I'll give you this, and God's offering me, bow down to me and I'll give you this, then surely both of them are offering the same thing. It makes yeah. no real logical sense. But if we look at it analytic analytically, we can see that I rejected the offer of rulership. Mm. Now, people say, oh, that's because it was offered by Satan. Okay, so let's go over a few more verses, shall we, to maybe, maybe to John 6. Um, 14 and 15, where it says, 
Now, after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So I again rejected the offer of rulership from people this time, not from Satan. And I also rejected the offer of rulership by force. Mm. In other words, I did not want to force rulership on anybody. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the difference between God offering me rulership by force and people offering me rulership by force? Well, well I put to you nothing. Yeah. God would never offer me rulership by force, force. And if God did, I would never accept rulership by force. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an inconsistency. In one verse in Matthew 24, it's saying that I have accepted rulership by force. And another verse in John 6, it's saying that I do not accept rulership by force. What's my character? Obviously, my character under in the Bible's definition, my character changes depending on who offers me something. Yeah. And that's not the case at all. If God offered me rulership by force, I would reject it. And I know, for example, that God will never offer me such a thing because God himself takes no rulership by force. Yeah. So he'd never offer me such a thing. That's why I reject it in every case. Mm -hmm. But the Bible is stating that God has offered me rulership by force and that I have accepted it. And both things are false. God cannot offer me rulership by force because God does not personally take rulership by force. And I would never accept rulership by force because I am at one or want to be at one with God. And so therefore could never be at one with God if I took rulership by force. Yeah. So, so this is proof, to, in my mind, it's definite proof. If I was listening to that discussion logically, I would see, wow, there's some inconsistencies there. It is also proof that I would never have predicted my own coming in the manner in which Matthew 24 describes it in that verse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the fact is somebody else predicted it this way, yeah. not me. Yeah. And uh, there were many predictions about the Messiah in the first century that I rejected because that's not what I wanted to be. Yeah. And it's also what I knew God didn't want me to be. Yeah. If we look at another example, um, so if I maybe could say my real, my real feelings about this one issue is that I would never accept rulership by force. I will never accept that God would offer me rulership by force. I will never come onto the earth and do what the Bible says I will do in Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21. I will never come and destroy the wicked for God or anybody else, because mm -hmm. I know God would never do it himself. Mm -hmm. And I would never take the elect who think they're the elect when most of them are not what I would classify to be loving people. In fact, I state that quite categorically in other verses in the Bible that are recorded. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, this is another way people misinterpret the Bible. Now, let's look at another example. Um, let's look at the issue of judgment. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bible says, if I look at... Uh, and maybe what we need is to have a pause so I can get all the Bible sure. verses together sure. that I want to get together, and then we'll go through the issue of judgment. Yeah. So let's do that. Okay. okay. So let's look at the issue of judgment, what the Bible says about me being a judge. So, so if you look at John 5, um, I think it's, uh, what is it, it's verse... Uh, 26 to 30, I think, are other verses I'll read. It says... For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all are, who are in the graves will hear his voice, the Son of Man's voice is referring to, and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. That's saying categorically that I was saying that I was a judge. Mm -hmm. That's what it's saying. Mm -hmm. Now, let's compare that with some other verses. Now, this is meant to be the same person as well. So, so here, now we have another verse here, and this verse is in uh, Matthew 7, 1 to 5. It says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. In the same, for in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, I'm telling other people not to judge, and yet I'm willing to accept judgment. I would call that hypocrisy. Yeah. 
But uh, obviously Christians don't call that hypocrisy. <laughs> they say that for some reason I've been given the judgment. But then let's have a look at some other verses. Let's look at, like, there's another one in Luke 12, 13 and 14. It says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? So there I'm saying quite categorically, I'm not the judge. Yeah. Right? I'm yeah. not a judge between people. Okay. If we look at John 3, 16 and 17, which is a very popular verse that most Christians have read most of their life. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then it says, For God did not send his world into the, son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So in other words, God didn't save, send me to condemn the world, so therefore I'm not a judge under this circumstance. Well, let's, and people go, oh, that's a bit of a strong inter long interpretation. Well, let's have a look at a few other verses that are quite categorical on the matter. If we look at John 12, 47 and 48, this is what it says. For the person who hears my voice and words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come in come to judge the world but to save it there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words that very word which i spoke to condemn him on the last day and here i'm referring to the judge being my father mm -hmm. so here categorically i'm saying i'm not the judge mm -hmm. so which is it <laughs> i'm either a judge or i'm not a judge and there, it quite, it quite clearly, I'm being contradictory. Yeah. On one hand, I'm saying that other people should not judge, but I'm allowed to. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I'm saying I'm not the judge, but God is. And then on the other hand, I'm saying, no, God's given me the judgment. Yeah. Now, these are all very contradictory statements. Now, I'm not a contradictory person. I don't make contradictory statements. I'm either a judge or I'm not. I either believe I am or I believe I'm not. Well, I believe I'm not. Mm -hmm. I definitely have not come to judge the world. I'm not going to judge anybody. I don't have the power to judge anybody. I have never been given the power to judge anybody. I am a son of God, just as every other person is a child of God. And God's laws all apply to me just as much as they apply to any other person. Therefore, there is no need for me to judge. And I cannot ever become a judge. Now, this is again where I feel the predictions about my coming are false. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole idea and concept in the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, that I will come as a judge and executioner of the wicked. Mm -hmm. This is completely false. It's not something that I wish to do. And it's certainly not something that God wishes me to do. And it's, but it is what most people want me to do. Mm. Most people who practice will believe they practice truth. Want somebody to come along and get rid of all the bad people for them. Mm -hmm. That's what they want. It's a, it's a very dark emotion, actually. What they want is they don't want to have to go to kill the bad person themselves. They want somebody else come along and do it for them. And, and that will never occur. God's never going to do that for you. God's created the universe perfectly. Everything is working perfectly. And the reason why things happen, happen the way they do is because of people's choices that are out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. I know that. I've known that for 2,000 years. I'm never going to return in the manner that is predicted in those verses of the Bible. Mm. So what we'll do in the future questions is we'll go through the specific verses of the Bible and talk about them. But if people can see from the two illustrations that I've given about these verses, that firstly, they are contradictory in, their, in what they're saying. They're con contradictory, not necessarily within themselves, but towards my own nature mm -hmm. and towards God's nature. Mm -hmm. God is not like that and I am not like that because I want to become at one with God and have been at one with God in the past in many, you know, for many years. And I am not like that either. And I'm never going to become like that. And I'm never going to do those things. Mm. And their Jesus, if they don't believe I'm Jesus, their Jesus is never going to do them either. And you can see that from the Bible quite clearly. Their Jesus is never going to take the actions that they say their Jesus will take. Mm -hmm because there Jesus is at one with God and God never takes those actions. And there Jesus has a, is a pacifist, is a person who, who's always focused on love, truth, peace, and those kind of qualities. He never would take something by force, and he never did. Mm -hmm. And if they don't believe I'm Jesus, they at least need to see that their Jesus would never take the actions 
that the Bible often says he should or would take. Mm. Mm. 